And we're back at the Javits Center. You're live with the Nest Summit. I'm joined today by Joey Lake from Climate Service. Joey, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Jeff. So I'm a big fan of the Climate Service and the work that you guys do, but for the audience's benefit, can you give us a little bit of background as to why the Climate Service was started and what was the genesis behind it? Sure. So the climate sur- at the Climate Service, we help companies and investors to understand their risk from climate change. So we don't help them to understand the impact of their company on the climate, but rather we help them understand the impact of climate change on their company or on their investments. Um, and why did it start? We are mission led. Our aim is to embed climate risk data into every financial decision on the planet. We believe that that will help reallocate capital and accelerate the transition towards a lower carbon economy. There's really three factors, though, that drove the genesis, I guess, of, of the climate service. So three factors driving demand for the type of data analytics that we provide. The first one was regulation. So going all the way back to 2015, when Mark Carney and Mike Bloomberg set up uh, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. So essentially said to everybody, we recommend that you assess your risk from climate change. And everyone said, okay, that's great. How on earth do we do that? (laughs) So we do help a lot of Fortune 500 companies and and financial services firms to assess um, their risk from climate change in order so they can comply with these types of regulations and guidelines. The second reason is really investor pressure. Um, And so we're seeing increasingly, not a day goes by now, without one large asset manager or asset owner saying, we need to understand better the risks that are in our portfolios because we know that climate change is the largest idiosyncratic risk that's left more or less unmeasured and unmanaged by most companies around the world. Um, And they're seeing the consequences of that now. So they want a better understanding of their risk so that they can um, better assess that risk and how much of it they want to carry. And then finally, and I think um, most importantly, we are now seeing the consequences of climate change. So we could have been sat here five years ago talking about this as a far off distant event that companies and investors need to prepare for. But in fact, it's already causing disruptions and financial losses today on a very large scale. And we've seen that in the news at the moment with the wildfires in California, with tropical cyclones that are more severe and more frequent than they ever have been in the past, flooding affecting so many different assets around the world and populations who are are very vulnerable to that. So all of those different uh, threads wrapped together is kind of the the raison d'etre of the, the climate service. Thank you so much. When we look at how you're analyzing all of this data, I know you adhere to the TCFD guidelines. Can you talk about why that's so significant? Sure. I guess the TCFD, there's so many different acronyms, sort of an alphabet soup of of different frameworks and standards and and things that people uh, are are trying to comply with within this world of ESG. Um, and so, and even ESG itself is an acronym. So within ESG, we only look at the E, we only look at the environment, and we only look at the impact of climate change on, on a company or on an investor. And in that niche space, TCFD is, is everything. It's the framework, framework by which all investors and companies are trying to comply. It's really been the guiding light uh, for everyone in this area of climate risk. Um, and it's provided a little bit of clarity, I would say, in this whole new space. A lot of folks would compare climate risk today with cyber risk of 10 or 15 years ago. So this new emergent risk, we're really not sure how to measure and manage it, what's best practice. And the TCFD has been a little bit of a lighthouse in that sort of journey as as folks struggle to better understand this new nascent risk. When we think about climate risk, I think most of the time when people think about risk, especially around climate, they're thinking of past risks that can be assessed. You know, you have a hurricane, you have a fire, you have a storm, and there's damage that's assessed to that, and that's your risk. They don't understand yet that that can be kind of foretold, um, that there's deep analysis that's going on about what the future risks of these companies are. Can you give us a little bit of explanation how your model, I think it's climamonics. um, Climonomics, yes. Climonomics, how climonomics actually looks into the future risks of climate? 
Great question, Jeff. I think that we, we hear that quite frequently. Um, people expect that insurance companies will have this wealth of data and models that will help them predict what their future risk is. And in fact, those catastrophic risk models are all built on historical data. So they're, they're sort of backward looking. Um, they're helpful if you're looking to insure a risk over the next six months, 12 months, but they don't take into account the change in climate. Um, and the only thing that we know for sure is that the future will be different to the past. So we know that uh, climate change is happening, um, is already baked in for the next 10, 15, 20 years, some, some degree of it. Um, and so we have these climate models, these global climate models that have been put together by hundreds and thousands of different scientists, um, which are our best understanding of what the world will look like in the future under different scenarios. Because of course, there is an element of uncertainty in there. What are people actually going to do? What are governments going to do in response to this huge threat? Will they tax carbon? Will they adopt policies that will mitigate some of this risk? So what we do is scenario analysis. Um, if policy looks like this, then your risk is gonna look like that. You might have more wildfires in parts of Europe um, and North America that you didn't experience previously. Um, and if there is a bigger policy response and and global warming is limited to, let's say, just two degrees Celsius, then the scenario looks like this for you. There's no wildfires there, there's less flooding there, and um, tropical cyclones are more likely to take this path. So it's future scenario analysis, which I've spent my best part of two decades in, but typically that was relating to different elections. If there's a Trump presidency versus a Biden presidency, this is what the regulatory environment will look like for you. Um, and instead, we're adopting that same framework and approach using these extremely powerful global climate models, um, coupling that with vulnerability functions and what we know from, from historical uh, catastrophic weather events, and producing a financial metric that puts a price on climate change. Joey, when you and I sat down really a year ago, what was interesting to me is that you said the release of the TCFD reports was really driving businesses coming to you and really for the first time realizing that they required the types of future analysis that your firm was doing. And in the past year, we've seen a, a host of climate-related risks hit the marketplace from Australian fires to California fires to record-breaking heat temperatures. I'm wondering if today you're seeing a big driver of your business and the need for your modeling coming from the realization that these risks are hitting today and not just from adherence to regulations. Yes, we have noticed a discernible trend and, and a really significant change in, in what's driving this. A few years ago, as you said, it was a sort of regulatory um, push. Um, and it depends what part of the world you're in, but here in North America, there's no doubt that most of the pressure is coming from investors who recognize that this transition is happening, um, that f the financial consequences of climate change are already being felt. So way back at the start of the year when Larry F Fink said that climate risk is investment risk, that caused a, a lot of waves in the market. But actually, we've gone a step further than that now. We are already experiencing the reallocation of capital because of climate change and the transition to a lower carbon economy. We've seen that with the rise of Tesla. People are already starting to price in future earnings that are disproportionate to anything that we know today. We've seen it with the oil and gas majors who have written down billions of dollars of assets because they recognize they will never take them out of the ground. So this financial reallocation of capital is already happening now in 2020. Um, and if you're not currently pricing in climate risk to your asset allocation models, then you're behind the curve at this point. You have some new innovations coming in your software and your modeling this fall. Is there anything that you can speak about now? What we have at this point in time is we believe the best approach to assessing climate risk in real assets. So if you're a company, if you're a, I don't know, a Coca-Cola of, of the world and you have hundreds or thousands of assets around the world, facilities, manufacturing um, spots and so on, we can help them understand the risk across all of those assets. What we're now doing is extending that out across other asset classes. So we are currently creating a, a listed equity product to be released in Q4 um, with some already some early asset managers, pension funds and asset owners on board for that. Um, and we've also had a, a huge amount of demand to apply our methodology to fixed income. So to municipal bonds, sovereign bonds, people are really thinking about this in a much more refined and sophisticated way than they were just 18 months or, or, or two years ago. So in wrapping, 
I think institutionally we're starting to see a great need or a rush kind of to the exits on figuring out climate risk right now. But the average investor, I think, is still way behind when it comes to what's going on behind the curtain. What advice would you give to investors and advisors that are just a little bit slow to understanding the great risk that climate change has to the capital markets? <clears throat> Good question, Jeff. I think, I think what I would love for investors to be doing right now is asking the right questions. I think that's first and foremost what what they should be doing. If you have a 401k, if you have a pension plan, um, and you know the companies that that is invested in, you should understand what the climate risk is that you're holding, especially if you're holding that over the longer term, so 5, 10, 15 years. There's a chance that some of your investments are invested in properties that could be underwater, literally and figuratively, <laughs> over the, in that time horizon. So um, I think what we have seen is that climate risk will will really reallocate capital across financial markets. It will create winners and losers, and you need to price that in, or your financial advisor needs to be pricing that in for you. I don't want to catch you off guard, so if you can't answer this, it's fine. But the ECB came out with a report about a week and a half ago that said that if the pandemic was, let's say, a 1.5% hit to global GDP, climate change will be more like a 4 to 5% hit to global GDP. When you look at that, I don't think people could even comprehend what a mass hit to GDP that is. Is that one of the factors that's really driving companies, that they are finally starting to understand that if they don't assess these risks, price them in, or take a different route, that they're going to be affected in just a huge way by the global cost of these risks that are coming down the pike? Yes, great question. We, this has been an extraordinary year, I think, for all of us. N nobody's been left untouched by the sort of devastation of, of COVID and, and so on, and as well as the economic and financial fallout from that. Um, what has been uh, really interesting for me is to see how the climate risk conversation evolved in that context. So we have clients who are among the that? hardest hit of uh, financially of all of these companies. So in the aviation industry, in the oil and gas sector, who've been devastated by the economic fallout from this. And what they have said, and this has been fascinating for me, as they have been forced to make cuts in a lot of different areas, they've said right from the C-suite on down that they need to come out of this stronger on climate risk because the impact of COVID has alerted them now to the risk that, that could hit them across the full value chain and their supply chain and their operations in the market. Um, and so it's actually been a bit of a wake up call, I would say, and reinforced uh, those efforts to better price in climate change to their decision making and strategy. Joe, I really want to thank you for joining us today. That's a wrap at the Javits Center for the Nest Summit. Thank you for joining us.